Yes, th th thank you very much, uh, Michelle, and it's a fantastic pleasure and honour to be uh, invited here. And uh, yes, Marianne is my gardening partner, and so uh, we, we, we will be talking a little bit about practical experience. And I, I, I wanted to sort of place the, uh, to, to look at the tasks uh, which are facing agroecology. And um, th this is something very much, you know, I, I feel we are part of the same family. We are agroecologists and, and so th we have this family bond and, and so we can uh, critically discuss things with, with each other as well. And um, so we, we, um, I, Marianne and I are allotment holders in, uh, in London and uh, all of you guys are very welcome to visit the allotment. We've been trying out agroecology techniques there. Um, so it's it's a sort of uh, it's a sort of subsistence uh, based thing. So really, we are trying to um, live off the vegetables we produce, and so th this provides an interesting uh, uh, discipline because we 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 really want to produce um, at least enough to eat or, or to share around, and so th this obviously means eating very seasonal stuff. Um, but it, it also we, we are both working. Um, as well, and so it, this has got to be a system with a low input of labour. So we 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 are producing a lot of food with with um, a small amount of time, and working within the constraints of the allotment, which is uh, two hundred and fifty square metres. Okay, so the, that's kind of the experiment. Um, I also teach at University College, and so the, this is where the political ecology um, angle comes from. So I will be exploring this and, and kind of using this as a uh, theoretical framework to look at some of the tasks which are facing agroecology now. And um, I'm, I'm really posing questions. I'm, I'm, I'm not. Uh, proposing any kind of dogma or really telling, uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm just pu putting forward um, open things which I think would be interesting for us to debate today and in the future. Um, so I, I, I'm just learning to use this. So I, I wrote this book, uh, which some of you will know, and um, I can freely uh, publicise it because it is free and so I'm not making any money out of it at all. Um, it, it is, uh, this was an um, experiment in open access publishing, which I d did through UCL Press, and I think that was very, very valuable. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm really, uh, I've had enough of writing uh, academic stuff for narrow audiences and I wanted it to be something which was freely available and w was um, kind of out there. So it, it, it has become part of the debate a bit. It had 35,000 downloads and this sort of uh, m m shows that open access publishing I think is the way to go. Um, so th this was published in December 2016 and in a way this feels like uh, prehistory because a lot of stuff seems to be changing um, since then and What, what, what I'm interested in is, is the new stage and, and, and to look at the kind of context. And there is a, uh, a sense of urgency, which we find in the uh, direct action and, and the protests. Uh, we have the, uh, the school students movement, which is a, a kind of a global thing. We have Extinction Rebellion um, in, in this country. Uh, we have the uh, the, the debates in, in the US uh, initiated by o o Ocasio-Cortez and so on. So these are all very interesting things which are bringing up in, in a way uh, a, sense of, uh, a sense of urgency which is something which is r r been injected into the discussion uh, relatively recently over recent months. And so this provides a context in for us to reflect on what our tasks are. And this notion of system change, uh, not, not climate change, I mean, it's been, it's been usurped by socialist worker there, but, but it's something which has been around for quite a long a time uh, as an idea. But uh, I think people are beginning to think about it in a more uh, practical term. So the, 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 this kind of invites us to think what we can contribute um, it implies a philosophy which spans 
uh, all of our systems and it would be a philosophy which looks at um, uh, embracing complexity <laughs> and uh, having systems which are adaptive and resilient in the sense that they can absorb shocks to make themselves stronger and so on. So I think if we talk about system change at, instead of climate change, then it's that kind of approach to systems that we want to talk about. Uh, we're learning from natural systems and we are using these lessons from natural systems, which are uh, intrinsically adaptive, um, uh, to, to apply them to our, uh, our systems, which could be political, they could be physical in terms of the built environment, uh, they, they could be any of those things. And this, this, is, a, so th th this is a big uh, a paradigm shift and um, it's something which agroecology ought to engage with very strongly, you know, and ought to in fact be central, centrally placed within, because agroecology is the interface between nature and society. And we, we're really well placed through our practical experiences, through the <coughs> interaction which we have with the natural world all the time. We're very well placed to understand <coughs> This kind of biomimicry, these kind of these kind of new ideas, which we can uh, use as a as a paradigm to um, feed into our uh, all of all our other systems, our physical systems, our political systems, our social systems, and so on. Now, the, so the, the, this uh, pushes in the direction of holistic thinking, but at the moment uh, we are too fragmented. And I think uh, what is preventing this uh, coming, coming together around a new paradigm is uh, a kind of fragmentation. You know, I could talk about silos, I don't really, it sounds like um, NGO speak, so I don't really like using it, and, and from agricultural point of view, silos ought to be something good anyway, so I won't talk about silos, but it, it's a sort of, it's, it's certainly a segregation uh, and, and a lack of communication, you know. For example, I, I was... I was speaking at this, uh, um, at this conference only last week and I, I was really a, li a little bit uh, disappointed by, by the uh, disconnect between a lot of different aspects, you know. Um, yes, they were talking about transition, transitioning to uh, plant-based agriculture, but they didn't say much about agroecology and the, the wider issues of connecting with uh, green systems and that kind of stuff seem to be absent. And so th this is sort of what we have, this is an issue which we have to address, which is why I want to uh, explore some of the uh, political ecology dimensions. Um, So, for, uh, for political economists have been uh, familiar for some time with the notion of uh, waves or cycles. And um, w if we're talking about, uh, you, you know, the, the future, the question is what this cycle is going to be. So, um, this is one model which was Im employed by the Russian uh, economist uh, Kondratiev in, in the 1920s. And um, it looks at a, a kind of long-term uh, vision of the uh, political economy. And it's a, it's a sort of wave-like motion, which I think is something which can interest us as um, agroecologists, because it sort of fits in with the models of ecological change which we uh, employ. Uh, this is Holling's model, which you, you, you guys would be very familiar with, I think, and he draws it in a figure of eight kind of thing. But it, it has these four, uh, these four uh, phases, okay? So I'm a little bit struck by the, uh, the analogy between, you know, the, the Kondratiev cycle has got these four, uh, four phases, and Holling's model does as well. And so I think that this connection is, is rather interesting. And if we if we stretch out Holling's model, so the, 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 I've unpicked the figure of eight and I've laid it out along a line, so it, it's exactly the same thing. And so you, you've got these these uh, four uh, phases. So each kind of phase of the 
um, of, of the system, it, you know, it, it goes through a process where it, it exploits what it's good at, it conserves what it has, and then it, it uh, moves into a kind of crisis phase or a rift where it transitions to a new, uh, a new kind of order. And so this is sort of, this has got, sort of got an ecological basis already, this uh, wave cycle pattern. But what we have to do now is to look at this in the context of, of the crisis and the urgency and all of these kinds of issues which are being addressed by the new, uh, the new kind of uh, framework today. So we have to solve this problem of climate change and species loss. And so we're talking about a transition to a kind of green uh, uh, cycle. So this idea is qu qu quite an interesting contribution and it makes a number of points here, particularly you know, the fact that you have a succession of cycles, uh, they, they are more and more intensive in terms of um, <coughs> innovation. But it's, t it's very typically defined by industry. And so what, what, what we need to introduce into this whole discussion is the role of, um, is the role of agriculture. You know, this, uh, this is kind of exclusively uh, an industrial uh, framework. And the, the, the question is where f um, agriculture fits in with the green wave. We could, uh, we could try to construct a, a wave-like pattern which deals with... Um, uh, specifically with agriculture, and, and, and I attempted to do that in my book. Uh, so I, I was looking at a series of waves. Uh, the, the, the ones along the top are when the system is relatively consolidated. The, the points where it dips down is where the system begins to break apart and, and needs to transition to a new structure. But I'm, I'm, I'm not going to explore that uh, at all today, because I'm really more interested in th uh, n not in producing an um, agriculture-specific model, but rather looking at where th these issues fit within the uh, post-carbon transition more generally. Um, wh wh what food has in common with in industry is that it's been uh, fossil fuel-based, and I think that, that this is an important point. So. <coughs> There's been a kind of uh, trajectory which has been locked in to uh, industrial capitalism from very early, where the development is premised on, on fossil fuels. And th this is uh, true of industry, but it's also true of agriculture. And in a way, we can inject agriculture, I think, in a central position within this debate. This path dependency was dealt with qu quite interestingly in this book by uh, Andreas Malm, and th th this is something which is worth looking at, and it's a contribution to the w which has been debated quite a lot, um, looking at how far uh, industrial capitalism has been intrinsically based on fossil fuels and w w why that happened. Um, one weakness in his argument is that it uh, focuses um, um, exclusively on industry. And therefore, uh, y y it, it neglects w what I would see as being the foundation of the whole thing. So in actual fact, we, we need to inject uh, the role of um, um, agriculture and food uh, centrally within that discussion. So the... The, this takes us to the, the question that, that, that we're looking at the food transition as part of a low carbon transition in general. That, that's really the key point. And so wh what do we mean by uh, transition? So uh, th uh, there's um, a couple of diagrams wh which I can use which um, come out of 
some of the literature on transitions. And the, um, the first one kind of looks at the overlapping between the different cycles because uh, the, w what, uh, w what the, the process um, of, uh, of transition between the cycles is obviously one where the, uh, the conditions of the uh, new one overlap with, with the old one. So you have um, uh, a carbon dominant cycle which gives way to uh, a new one. So you're, you're, you're transitioning from a, uh, an old form of abundance which, which is kind of a, a phony one because it's based on fossil fuels into a new abundance which is based on sustainability. And so the two um, overlap and there is a, a period of uh, a messy mix which is happening uh, in, in between the two. So the way in which this uh, transition comes about we can see in, in this model. So th this is kind of a, a, a way of ex um, enlarging it still further. So, so we're looking much more closely at the actual processes. So the um, overlapping between the two phases is one where the characteristics of the new one begin to emerge even while the old paradigm is still dominant. And so they emerge within uh, niches and they are kind of uh, contained within niches uh, but there a, th a threshold takes place where the niches then become the, the, the new paradigm. So the new paradigm emerges in very small places and then it, it consolidates in, into uh, a, f a fundamental system change. So th this is one of the ways in which we can um, look at system change as a process. So arguably, uh, this, has this literature dates from about 2007, so um, arguably we've moved a bit faster and that, that's an encouraging sign because I, I would say probably the messy mix is already uh, with us, uh, w which is k kind of a good thing because it shows that there is a mixture of um, hope and fear, there, there's a mix mixture of uh, um, depression and optimism and there, there is a mixture of a stubborn uh, remnants of the old paradigm and, and uh, elements of a new paradigm which are still somewhat uh, isolated niches. You know, so th this may be the characteristic of where we are now. And so um, it's quite good if we are part of the messy mix now. Uh, the energy transition, for example, is moving uh, much more quickly than would have been uh, pr proposed uh, a few years ago. So the, these are elements of transition w which are happening very, very quickly now. And you can have a, a threshold where suddenly uh, renewable energy becomes cheaper than uh, fossil energy and then the, sh the changeover can happen very quickly. So the renewable uh, technologies like LED lighting and, and uh, solar panels and that kind of stuff were very much small elements in, in, in niche markets which are, which are very expensive but, but suddenly there's a tipping point where they become uh, m much more accessible, much cheaper and becomes a new paradigm, you know. And so th th we're actually in a process of conversion from this point of view, from the energy point of view, then, then I think you can see the messy mix very clearly and, and the elements of the uh, qualitative leap into a new mode of organisation are very much uh, visible around us. The question is whether food and agriculture is keeping pace with this and this is a critical question which uh, we need to pose, you know, are we doing enough? Are, are we, uh, are we uh, really up with some of the more advanced uh, changes which are happening in other areas of the economy or are we lagging behind? Uh, we are a niche and, and there's nothing wrong with being a niche because this model shows that niches are the way in which the new paradigm uh, establish establishes itself in small pockets before it becomes generalised. So there's nothing wrong with niches. but. Um, under what conditions do they become the mainstream? So th this is really a question I want to pose to us and I think that this is something which we need to reflect on very critically. Um, a theoretical issue which comes in here is the issue of um, entropy. 
so I, I did produce this book and, and I was sort of uh, l looking at the question of um, w whether capitalism had confronted its limits and was beginning to be uh, squeezed by a kind of uh, loss of structure. And what the effects of that uh, squeezing would be. Um, they could be pushing in the direction of a green transformation. They could be pushing in the direction of something quite bad and reactionary, where the system uh, consolidates itself in uh, a bad way, in, in a kind of repressive way, by uh, ex exploiting some of the uh, more evil aspects of its past. And um, so uh, this, this was the sort of question which I was d debating in that book. But um, I, I, I didn't really uh, apply it to, to the food issue. And so I, I wanted to just think a little bit about how we can look at the entropy question in relation to um, in relation to food and agriculture, um, j just to go back a little bit to uh, looking at this um, argument by Andreas Malm, he does um, he does address the entropy issue uh, in quite an interesting way. But what wh what he is trying to do is to, in a way, it's a it's a uh, analysis which places the critical emphasis very strongly against uh, against capitalism. And what he's saying is that fossil fuels were not an intrinsic part of capitalism. They were simply uh, introduced because they made labour easier to control. This is quite an interesting uh, idea, but the, as part of this argument, what he has to do is to, um, is to argue against the notion of entropy in a way because he uh, he's cr he's critiquing a, a sort of discourse which says that we have a sort of human uh, drive towards growth which hits against limits and that fossil fuels is a way to get around that so uh, p part of his argument is to uh, criticize the uh, theoretical basis of the um, notion of limits. And the uh, economists who he criticizes, particularly are Malthus and, and uh, David Ricardo. So R Ricardo put forward the idea of diminishing returns. Uh, Malthus, as, as we know, put forward the idea that population was rising and would hit against a finite food supply. So th this is sort of the argument about limits. And Malm is saying, uh, no, this, uh, this whole argument is nonsense. And therefore, this uh, drive to growth doesn't really exist. And it is not a, a failing of humanity. It's a failing of capitalism. Capitalism brought in fossil fuels because it needed to exploit people. So this is, this is an interesting um, argument, but I'm, I'm not uh, altogether happy with it because it, it seems to me to be retreating away from the entropy issue and failing to confront it head on. And I think th that's what we need to do. We, we need to raise very clearly the idea, um, is there such a thing as diminishing returns in agriculture? And if so, how do we, how do we uh, hit back against that? How do we convincingly say that we can feed the planet? This is the question which we need to, to answer. And we, we shouldn't retreat away from that. Uh, we have to confront this in the right kind of way. This is really the most important thing that I wanted to throw into this debate. Um, so just to sort of lo look at this a little bit historically, This uh, d debate is a very uh, um, interesting one, uh, which goes back to the mid-19th uh, century. So Henry Carey is a US economist who uh, ad ad attempted a very, um, a c quite an exciting idea, really, which is looking at um, 
the visioning futures. So wh 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 what, what, what he's saying from the mid-19th century standpoint is, uh, what is a future economy going to be like? Uh, it's a visioning exercise, which would be interesting for us to pursue, you know, because we're, we're talking now about system change. W w what do we think the future system is going to be? So he posed this question back in, in the mid-19th century, and he said, what, what, what kind of economy is likely to, de to develop? Which direction are we going in? And the basis for this was food. He, because Carey's argument is very clear, we, we cannot vision any kind of future unless we deal with food supply. That's the bottom line. Anything else we can add on and say what we want, but we must convincingly um, answer the question of how this society is going to feed itself. So th this is the question which I'm really placing on the table, which we need to give a, a, a really... Um, a, a, a really good answer to, and, and we, we, we must not retreat away from that question. So he, uh, he attacked the same guys as Andreas Malm is attacking, but I think in a much more convincing way, because he, 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 he based his, his argument on the issue of food, and he looked at very, very closely at land. And he said, w what is the productivity of, of, of land based on? How can we talk about the past development of this land? How can we pr project this into the future? Um, how can we give a, a really a thorough answer to this? And so he, he, he goes into great detail as the foundation for his whole paradigm. Uh, he's a US economist, so he's looking at the United States, he's looking at the land there, and he's saying, C can this land um, continue to reproduce itself without losing structure, without losing fertility, without being eroded, and continue to feed the population. So he answers this in, in a rather optimistic way, and he says, yes, it can. Uh, so, so at least he is taking on these guys, uh, uh, Malthus and Ricardo, in a, in a meaningful way. And uh, uh, I th this is something which... Um, then began to uh, be very closely related with the development of Marx's ideas. So uh, M M Marx's uh, critical discussion of the work of Carey is a very, very important one. And th this is something which I would really like to explore m more thoroughly. Um, M M Marx, Marx, of course, was critical of uh, Malthus, and uh, he, uh, M Marx had a, a somewhat optimistic vision of the future of Humanity, which was a socialistic economy and that kind of stuff. But uh, Marx understood very clearly that you, you could not make that uh, prediction unless you could say how you would feed this population. So he's saying, OK, um, so, uh, you know, it, it, it will be possible to do that. And then when uh, uh, Justus von, von Liebig came along and looked at the question of the uh, chemical uh, demands of crops, then uh, Marx kind of was quite interested in that argument because uh, what, what uh, 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 von Liebig was saying was that you could, you could, um, uh, you, you could overcome entropy by, by uh, supplying chemicals to, to the plant. You know, so, so the, the, uh, the d diminishing returns from land w would not happen because you, you, would be, you would be replenishing the uh, chemical elements which they required. L later on, then, <coughs> uh, Justus von Liebig himself began to see that th this was uh, the wrong idea. And w what you needed to do was to think of the structure of the soil. And you needed to um, replenish that in a natural way ra rather than an artificial way. So the, the chemical revolution, which he sort of opened up, he then shot down. And so uh, Marx sort of followed uh, uh, Justus von Liebig in doing that. And so the, the, the question is, how do we... Uh, again, convincingly, say that without uh, artificial chemical inputs, we are still able to replenish the soil. Okay, so w w one part of the argument is the metabolic argument, uh, which is uh, that the, the waste products become circulated back. 
So th there we are restoring the natural cycle because the, uh, the waste products are uh, brought back into the picture. And th this is a very important part of... Um, uh, it's something which uh, von Liebig understood. It's something which Marx uh, based qu qu quite a lot of his thinking around. And uh, John Bellamy Foster's analysis of Marx's uh, work in which he um, brings these elements to the fore is very important. So th this is the element in, in favour of the circular economy. So we, we, uh, we tried to do this in UCL with anaerobic uh, composting and th th this is a kind of illustration of how this can be done. And so we, we've, we've created a, a, a cycle again <coughs> uh, using uh, food waste which is, is composted down and then you get methane gas and, and you get a digestate which can be used in fertilizer. So uh, as part of this project uh, there is a cafe and we use the methane gas to cook. We, we grow food on site using the digestate as fertilizer and use the methane gas to cook the food. So this is one way in which we can, we can uh, talk about uh, restoring the, the cycle. But I think that the, 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 the cyclical um, answer is only part of it, and I think the other part, which I think is, uh, b to me is more important, is the question of the self-organisation of complex systems. And th this is sort of the soul of agroecology, uh, because w we, we are actually um, using the, uh, the adaptive powers of nature to create their own system, so we don't have to work. Uh, we, we minimise our own uh, labour, our own input. Uh, we allow, we kind of allow, uh, we, we relinquish control. You know, we, we don't want to control the variables too much. Uh, it, with a complex system, you cannot predict beyond a certain point. The whole thing which went wrong with conventional agriculture was trying to uh, narrow the parameters in order to make it um, predictable. What we're trying to do in agroecology is the opposite. We're embracing the unpredictability and, and the self-organising uh, forces of complexity. And so what, what, what Marx referred to as this kind of um, the free gift of nature's uh, power is uh, something which uh, ultimately I would see as something, this is even more important than the cyclical argument. It's really the na na nature's gift is the free energy supplied by self-organising systems. And so th this is kind of the approach which we try to explore in our uh, allotment, wh where we will sort of deliberately go away on holiday and, and leave it unattended. Uh, you know, so we will go away for a month and leave it completely to itself. And then when we get back, it kind of surprises us, but it's created a new kind of uh, self-organizing structure, which we could not possibly have controlled or predicted. But it's actually much more strong and robust than anything which we could have, we could have uh, controlled. There is still an, an element of design, you know, we talk about permaculture des design, but it's not the designer as an om omnipotent control freak who uh, understands every variable and tries to uh, limit them and narrow them down. It's the opposite. It's the designer who is working with the, who is embracing the, uh, the, the principles of the new systems design and doing things in a completely different kind of way. We, which is what, um, which is what agroecology does, and where agroecology is better than simply organics, you know, because organics could be defined in a n purely negative way of eliminating chemical inputs, and agroecology is is a very positive definition. That uh, so, I think it is the free energy of co uh, complex systems which I is the ultimate answer to entropy. In other words, the answer to uh, erosion, the loss of soil, and the loss of structure. Um, and this is sort of the solution in which we can give a, a really convincing and meaningful um, answer to these questions which were posed by uh, Ricardo and Malthus. Which, uh, which enables us also to I insert agroecology within low carbon transitions, which is what we need to do. You know, we're talking about a benign feedback loop 
uh, between carbon sequestration and uh, enhanced fertility. We're getting carbon into the soil, and the, uh, the more soil we get in the carbon, the more plants grow, the more, uh, uh, the, the more carbon in turn comes into it. We're sequestering carbon, the fertility is improving. So this, th this, is, this is the, the key idea which kind of inserts us centrally I'm saying us as a family. It inserts us centrally within low carbon transitions. Th 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 this is what we need to do. Um, um, which is connected with the idea of um, sustainable intensification. You know, uh, sustainable intensification has been put forward by the FAO. It's it's been debated quite a lot. Um, the corporations are trying to uh, co-opt it, but but nevertheless, it, it it remains a valid idea in the sense that we have to produce larger yields with a smaller area of land, and um, uh, you know the 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 the, the, cu the cultivated surface is shrinking to allow for rewilding, uh, but at the same time we have to produce more. And so this, this is something where we, need, we are confronting the entropy problem and I think resolving it so long as we follow uh, uh, agroecology. So on our plot, for example, I mean, we're growing very frequent uh, crops. And um, <coughs> uh, for example, uh, Charles Dowding, who uh, is qu quite a, a guru of, of uh, no-dig method, sa said that he doesn't really have much time for green manures because uh, you're, you're, you're uh, ro rotating crops so, so quickly that y y there isn't any free space, you know. And so, yeah, we, we, we use leguminous uh, green manures, but um, comparatively little, and be because we're, we're always... Uh, w w in a given year, there are several crops in a particular area of land. Um, compost is fundamental if we're replenishing the land, and I think this, th this is the key um, issue in organic uh, farming, in a way. I just wanted to look a little bit about the, some of the contradictions in relation to compost, which, again, are, are not often... Uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to ask the awkward questions, which one very often retreats away from. So the Da Vinci Code of Organic Agriculture is um, this uh, secret uh, manuscript from the, the Knights Templars, w which was discovered in a, in a Spanish priory. So the, the, this is a 12th century uh, m manuscript, which, which was... Um, it, it, it was taken up by this guy, Daye, who is uh, a leading uh, authority on, on the Templars, and so he produced this paradigm for agriculture, w which has been quite influential. And um, the, uh, the, the, the compost community in France is riven with uh, all sorts of factional uh, d d disputes, and, and the disputes between sort of Joan Crawford and Betty Davis, or whatever, is nothing compared with some of the way some of these guys um, r r really hate each other. The re re reading this book is extremely um, entertaining from from that from that point of view. Um, but wh what what the uh, the Knights Templars did w was that they they created this kind of uh, uh, m model where they explained exactly how you create these enormous heaps of of, of compost, and th th this is this is taken on board quite a, uh, a following of acolytes. Um, but the, the the problem seems to me, I mean, what what, what the the Knights Templars apart from. Uh, you know, carrying out genocide in, in, in the Middle East and this kind of stuff. They, they, they were presume they must have been uh, clearing huge quantities of brush in order to supply this uh, amount of, uh, of compost. And uh, the, the, the question is, you know, wh where, where do we get the, the compostable material to supply what's required? Um, so, assume, uh, b v very typically in, in uh, organic farming manuals, they call for a 40 millimetre mulch. And if we, uh, you know, if, if you take a 250 square metre plot and, and multiply this out, it gives you uh, 10 cubic metres of, of compost which you need in a given year, which is quite a lot. Now, 
th this is what we actually do. And so we, we have quantified this and, and, and applied it. And we, we, we do produce 10, 10 cubic meters uh, per year. But it is, it is a, a fair effort and we have to work out where it's all coming from. So I think about 50% of it comes from um, simply the waste within the plot. But uh, some of it needs to come from outside. So the constraints of organic agriculture would have to um, answer where the compost is coming from. <coughs> you know, we, which is a fundamental element in whether we can convincingly uh, deal with entropy. So what what, what we do, what, what um, there are different. You know, I mean, I think using. Uh, plants with very deep root like uh, Russian comfrey is one way in which we can uh, draw uh, nutrients from the lithosphere be be below the soil and, and then feed this back into the system. So in that sense the, the, the plot is not a, a closed system. Although it's confined to 250 square meters w we can go down, you know. Um, <coughs> uh, rock dust is, is another thing because this is a form of geoengineering uh, in, in, in which you are uh, you are sequestering carbon, in a way, and uh, we we we're, we're playing around with uh, uh, using wood chip uh, as a modified form of um, hugel hugel bed, which um, so you you are b making quite a deep layer of a wood chip, and so what 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 we are experimenting with is is creating this bed covered with wood chip, and then we're putting some compost in top. We're, we're growing some crops there, uh, and but the, the main purpose of it is to allow the wood chip to rot down over a couple of years and replenish the soil. So the, these are all issues of how we are uh, combating uh, entropy, uh, hopefully successfully. Um, how self-contained should we try to be? So th this is an issue which I, I debated. There, there is a... Um, the magazine Resurgence had, had a feature on circular economy and, and uh, I, I wrote a piece there which, which you could check out but, but w w what I was trying to look at was um, w w are, are we, uh, you know, is our farm a subsistence farm? I mean, w w what we're doing is subsistence so it could be purely self-contained but that, that doesn't work as a paradigm uh, for the broader uh, solution to the food problem. So you 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 can you know the the subsistence model could be a kind of survivalist model. So the, the, this is this one called garden poo, which you, some of you will have heard of this probably. It's in the, in the U.S. So it's in a a kind of uh, hot and dry area of the U.S. and it's it's based around this. Um, this uh, disused swimming pool, but th th this has become a model which the the uh, people who invented this have been propagating this this quite widely, um, and it's it's being used as a uh, it, it, it's uh, as a paradigm by NASA because it, it's obviously very closely related to what they're trying to explore in terms of planetary, uh, you know, establishing planetary colonies and that kind of stuff. But um, it's it's. Uh, it is kind of closed in and cut off. It's 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 a really a subsistence thing, and what what we need to understand is how we can have a, um, a sustainable uh, agricultural system, which at the same time is is reaching out. Is is supplying a surplus. Is supplying uh, society in general. So is therefore more open. So. This is one example which I'm sure uh, some of you will be familiar with. So the, the, this is in France and this is a, a beautiful application of permaculture design principles with fantastically beautiful um, beds and, uh, it's, and the introduction of kind of drones to, to, to photograph these things now. It's, it's really, really beautiful. Um, but do we need to reach out if we're to become the mainstream? So the, this is the question. And I, I'm, I'm wondering whether, you know, the, the, this c can a project like this act as, as the uh, module? Can we multiply projects like this as modules uh, to, to become the mainstream? 
you know, at the moment they are niches, they are isolated niches. Can we multiply them to become the mainstream? Th 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 this is a question we need to look at. And I think this raises the question of whether we need to mechanize in some way. And the question is how? In order to increase the productivity, can we mechanize in a way which does not uh, in inhibit the operation of the natural sustainable system? So th th these are all questions which we need to pose. And th this is a very uh, interesting uh, thing which led me to r reflect on this. Um, this uh, film by Z uh, Xavier Beauvoir. Have any of you guys seen it? Okay, so the, 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 this is really something you should do. You should organize a, a, a showing here, for sure. It's, it's, a, it's an amazingly good film, but it's also uh, incredibly educational. And I, I kind of, it's rather rare experience because I really enjoyed <laughs> it at a, at a sort of very personal level. But at the same time, <coughs> I, w I, was, I was able to reflect on it politically and in terms of uh, w w w what it, what it uh, tells you about agriculture. So it, it's focused in a very, very short period of time, which is uh, around, you know, the, uh, in, in World War I. Uh, but it, it compresses a lot of historical changes. So w the w w what happens uh, um, at the beginning of the film... Yeah, so it's, it's about the women who kind of took over uh, farming and transformed it while the, while the guys were all out uh, suffering PTSD in the trenches and this kind of stuff. Um, so um, at, at the beginning, I mean, the, w the way this is portrayed in the film is that the, 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 the labour is incredibly harsh, you know, because everybody's doing everything manually, they're harvesting manually and this kind of thing. But um, at the same time, it's cooperative because it needs to be and so the uh, uh it's it's oppressive it's 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 horrible but but it's also uh, collaborative and um what 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 happens is that uh is subsequently they um they organize it more as a business and so they begin to invest in machinery um and the product producti productivity improves the uh, the backbreaking element of labour uh, is no longer there, but the so social solidarity is lost. Then everybody becomes exploitative and individualistic, and so we we've lost uh, we've lost the social cohesion. So there is a so sort of social entropy which takes over, and this is something which we ha have to uh, w which we need to address. So th this is what. Um, agroecology needs to do. Somehow, in a physical sense, we're, we're working with uh, the properties of self-organisation in nature, and in a social sense, we're working with social self-organisation. So, so we, we, we need to find a way of... Um, uh, uh, re, 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 uh, we, we need to find a way of increasing pro productivity which d doesn't make it um, oppressively... Uh, 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 g g uh, you know, I I labor intensive, um, and which d doesn't sacrifice it, it. It 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 mustn't sacrifice social sol solidarity. It must build social solidarity. So this is the the question which we're faced with, which is the last kind of question I'm 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 coming on to. So I'm I'm just looking at this example. So th this is. Um, uh, uh, L'Atelier Paysan in, in France. So th th this is a cooperative of uh, small uh, organic farmers. But wh what they are doing is actually to look at uh, how they can produce machinery which is compatible with um, sustainable organic farming and which um, doesn't uh, destroy the soil. So this is a, a, a technical issue which I find really, really interesting. And the, the way in which they are doing this is to explore the socially collaborative elements. So they're using open source technology. Uh, it, uh, they're, uh, they're pr they're, these are blueprints which can be freely adapted. 
you know so it's 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 like uh, uh, um, open source IT open source code but they're applying it to design of um, agricultural machinery um, as a cooperative so I think th th this is a This, this is a, um, a, a, a paragraph, oops. Um, a dr drawing out of uh, what, what, what the, the way they explain their work, I, 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 I find this re really, really interesting. Um, Yes, yeah, so it's talking about technological uh, sovereignty. I, I think the, 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 the bit that, that I, I, I really think is worth exploring is this one. Um, in market gardening, crops are grown on beds formed from long strips of land. Little or no attention is paid to ground compaction by tractor wheels. In subsequent years, farmers will try to grow on these tracks. So what, what they're saying instead of this, so the, this is the system which they're trying to improve, to get away from in fact. The idea of permanent ridged beds is to form perennial growing beds so that the tractor wheels always run in the same place. Tools are needed to form these ridged beds which allow crops to have superior moisture retention and drainage and to warm up better. So in, in effect what, what, what this means is that uh, it's, it's a no dig method. Um, in which you, uh, you are using machinery in a way which doesn't compact the soil. So this is, uh, seems to be a really nice idea, and so you need a different kind of approach of machinery. So you, you have a, um, a long bed and, and the, the, the wheels of the machinery run on, on the pathways between the beds, so, so it never compacts the soil. So may, may, maybe this is kind of part of the solution. I'm just giving this as an example of how we can look at um, the, the way in which a sustainable farming system can uh, uh, operate um, in, in such a way that it becomes the mainstream, it, 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 it becomes the dominant paradigm, that we can produce enough food that uh, the um, old-style agriculture becomes obsolete in the same way as uh, as um, high carbon uh, e energy is becoming obsolete. That's a question which, which we face. So maybe we need to mechanize, maybe we need to create a new, uh, a new generation of tools to do this. Um, and this implies uh, community, so um, it is all about uh, regenerating society and so the, the, this again is part of the reflection of, of this group. So this takes me to the conclusion. So we, we, we can minimize entropy through giving uh, full uh, scope to, to complexity working with self-organizing systems and, and this is something where we can have a kind of synergy between the, uh, the physical model of the cultivation and the social model. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.